There's a couple things we need to cover. Huh. Uh, do you think we should learn out about pistons? Oh, yeah. Let's, then let's do got it. got four of them. Really? Yeah. Do you realize that that's actually now the big engine? In a Mini, the big engine's a four-cylinder. Yeah, yeah. Now it's three-cylinder. That was all you need. Like, well, well, I disagree <laughs> with you. And you and I, I know we can't talk about this on camera. Right. I know you have more cylinders at home. I've got a recently. couple that have more than that. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk about your new pistons. Most of the engine is the same. The yeah. 2.5 Skyactiv G engine is pretty rock solid. We did some fine tuning to the piston. Yeah. Uh, knock resistance is the number one thing with this engine. Now explain got, to us why that got, that's an issue with a high compression engine. We've got 13 to 1 compression. Yeah. We run on 87 octane crap gas, the cheap stuff. And that uh, knocking is when you're compressing the air and fuel and it ignites on its own at the wrong time. Yeah. Right? From some hot spot in there. Uh, and you get so much heat from the, from that high compression that it wants to ignite on its own. Uh, especially with low octane gas. So and we found a, a spot on the piston that was was hotter than the rest. And right how on, are you right able on the to edge. Pinpoint a hot spot. Oh, don't ask me. I don't know. That's the guys in Japan. You're supposed to know that's this. The guys in Japan that do it. Okay. The way I do it is when I race my Miata and I tear it down every 15 races when it explodes, the edge of the piston is worn off because it's been destroyed from being too hot. Okay. So when they told me about this change, they did to the piston. I'm like, yeah, that looks familiar. Should have done it in 1990. But. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, that corner of the piston is getting heat from the top and from the side and is getting cooled from the backside. But there's a big, in the very corner of the piston, there's a big space uh, between the heat source and the heat rejection on the back. Yeah. So that corner kind of gets hot. And so we just cut the corner off. Just cut a little notch out of the corner, uh, off the edge of the piston. Okay, so that's the piston. That's the part of the piston you can see. Oh, and you changed the else. We also changed the piston skirts on the sides where the... Uh, Skirts always look like they're just straight, yeah. but they're always kind of barrel shaped. Uh -huh. And we've changed the barrel shape on the one side and the other side of the piston to be different because mm -hmm. it turns out one side always sees the side load from from compression, mm -hmm. and then the rod goes around the other side and you ignite it, and the compre the the power stroke is a lot harder, pushes down a lot harder, and always leans on the other skirt. So one skirt has a really high load, one skirt has a smaller load. So the lightly loaded skirt. We put sort of more of a barrel shape, so it, it's a little smaller contact area with the uh, with the, the cylinder wall, mm -hmm. and there's less friction that way. And did the Japanese engineers come up with this, or did you come up with this? No, I didn't do it. I don't design the pistons. I just show them to you. Now, talk to me about what you did on the engine. The output's almost the same. Yeah. 185 it, or something like uh, that? The peak, out, the, the peak went up to 187. Um, and the Torx 184. But most most of the work we did uh, is in making the engine more responsive, having you know quicker transients, more more direct uh, response to the gas pedal. Um, it's you know we got some better knock resistance from that little change on the edge of the piston. Yeah. And instead of using that to try to squeeze every last horsepower full throttle, we focused on getting better, uh, uh, quicker response. So that's the same like with the MX-5. That engine makes 155 horsepower, 91 octane gas. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the same engine in uh, Mazda 3 makes 155 horsepower and 87 octane gas. So what, what the hell do we do with all that knock resist resistance from the octane? Yeah. We used it to get quicker throttle response, quicker transients, and that makes a huge, big difference in the way the car drives. So is it the kind of thing you did with the CX-9, where you like programmed in what a torque should be? Is that what you did? I don't know what you think we did with the CX-9. Well, the, the, the CX-9 CX actually will respond to different octane levels and give you more power. We I understand that, that but there's certain flat points in the CX-9 because you focused on torque at certain areas we for tuned drivability. That, we tuned that whole engine for really high torque output and, and gave up on some, some higher RPM horsepower uh, as a trade-off. Really, here what we did was we focused our effort on the details of what happens when you're actually driving in the real world. So, just... 40% throttle launch condition, and what happened? When does it shift into second gear? How continuous is the is the is the pull from the engine? We got complaints that you know when you pull away from an intersection, turn you know, turning it an intersection, you pull out, and it would immediately it would shift into second gear too early, and then kind of feel like it was suddenly weaker, and uh, right when you've got cars coming behind you. So we've, now we've got a better shift rhythm. It stays in first longer, stays in second longer, and kind of just stretches out more. It feels more natural and gives you more of what you want. Um, the, the, the tip in response when you first tip on the throttle, we shaved a couple milliseconds off that. We've got it down to under a quarter of a second uh, tip in delay from, from a standing start. And that's about the threshold of what you can feel. Uh, as uh, uh, we put people in simulators and try to tell them 
have them tell us when they can feel any delay. Anything under 250, 250 milliseconds, they don't feel it. Um, so that's kind of been our, our benchmark for that. So it, the engine feels livelier and stronger, more intuitively does what you want. Downshifts faster, downshifts earlier. Um, it just it, That's the kind of stuff that we're focused on rather than a catalog number. So what they don't know mm. is like, I go to a lot of these presentations yeah. and it's nothing but bullets and numbers. Right. Your presentation. I don't even know that any numbers. It, it, there was like there was only three numbers throughout the whole presentation. <laughs> right. It was all like laundry list of things you've changed. Right. And this more the real world stuff than yeah. numbers. Right. Right. Because Which it turns out kind of odd, doesn't most it? people that drive our cars drive them in the real world. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, speaking that's of, something we've discovered with our market research. Let's talk real world then. Okay. Explain to us how the the GVC works and what it is. Okay. G vector and control. Yeah. Sounds really complicated. Yeah. It's so dead simple. The tire's a squishy balloony thing. When really? You, I didn't know that. Yeah. When you turn the wheel and you try to make the car turn, the squishy balloony thing's gotta react. Yeah. That squishy balloon is is like stiffer this? and more uh, responsive if you put a little if you push down on it. Okay. So when you're turning into a corner, what we've noticed is that that if you watch really closely what drivers are doing when they turn into a corner, they tend to have a little turn in and speed up and hesitation and back off a little adjustment right at turn in. Yeah. And that's because the way the tire is going to respond each time you turn in is a little bit different, a little bit unpredictable. So people will tend to turn in a little bit and if it doesn't respond like they wanted it to, we'll turn it a little bit harder and then back back off. And this happens in a fraction of a second. You forget that you did it and your passengers all kind of fly, flopping around and they think you're an idiot. Um, so what we've done is we've talked, we've taken the steering computer and the engine computer and told them to talk to each other. When you turn the wheel, the engine will pull out a little bit, reduce the torque just a hair and transfer a little bit more load onto the front tires. And that tightens up the tire and makes it respond more, more quickly. And we've tuned it so that it's consistent all the time. If you're completely off the throttle, of course it doesn't do anything because it can't reduce torque beyond zero, mm -hmm. but you've already got the weight on the front tire, so you've got that good response. If you're accelerating, we turn the wheel and it takes away just enough power just to weight the tires and make them behave as they would have when you were off the throttle. So every time you turn in, it feels exactly the same. And as a result, you drive more smoothly because you're getting exactly what you expect. And this all comes from the way we look at uh, what we want the car to do. We focus on the car driver interface, that interaction, and making the car feel completely intuitive instead of playing with all these numbers and bullet points, mm -hmm. right? And when you do that, you start to notice things like this, and you start coming up with systems like, like GVC that, that work on these little details that pay off, because you've turned the wheel 15 times while I've been having this conversation, and every one was nice and smooth. You counted? Right? Yeah, yeah, I was doing two things at once. Yeah. But that's my professional rally racing background. Right. Uh -huh. Coming out of a Lotus. Right. Rally the Lotus? No, a Challenger. Okay. Which is even worse. Well, that doesn't to rally. make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, when someone gives you a free ride, you do it. Yeah. Okay. That's I, when I'm you get a race car and yeah. the gasoline and the tires for free. That's why you take anything. So, how does this system, the GVC, how does it compare to like Porsche Torque Vector? Oh, it's it's a completely different concept than Torque Vector. So, Torque Vectoring is trying to drive the, the two wheels at a different speed. Yeah. To rotate the car. And you can expand the performance envelope of the car that way, but we're, it doesn't necessarily feel natural. Mm -hmm. Like when you have a torque vectoring car, you'll get up close to the limit and you'll get to right where you think it's over and then all of a sudden something else will happen and it'll do more. And you're like, hey, wow, I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. It might be, a, it might be a, a positive surprise that you didn't expect that if you happen to be somebody who, who's got their head still with them when they're driving that hard. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to do nothing unexpected. We want the car to be completely predictable and completely intuitive. And those extra yaw moments are not intuitive. So the way a car should intuitively move, when you turn the wheel, it should respond without any delay. It should roll in a certain way. It should always, it should always roll down. Uh, Is this that harder field, to do in a, tall, in a tall vehicle? Uh, not necessarily, no. Um, it, it's, it's, this kind of goes back to one of the other things that we've improved on this car. Getting the car to corner in the right way involves making the car kind of roll diagonally and roll. The, the, when you turn the wheel, even the slightest amount, you want the car to start to move very easily. You don't want it to, to stick. Um, because if the suspension's bound up a little bit, when you turn the wheel, the load on the tire's a little bit weird and it'll, it'll, it'll start to turn in one way and then when the suspension breaks free and starts moving, suddenly the yaw will change. And that's one of those things you end up having to chase. 
So we do a lot of work to take friction out of the suspension. So even a tiny steering input will make the car uh, move. And so, this is one of those things that talks to your subconscious. When when you when you or your passengers see the front of the car move down, that programs your balance center to say, hey, something's happening, and you start to, to brace yourself. And it's all completely subconscious, but it makes it easier for you to, to be comfortable in the car. So while we're on that topic, yeah. talk to me about when you say friction, you did something with the struts. We did some change on, on the struts to the, to the spring perches. So a strut has to do two jobs. It's a shock absorber. It's sliding up and down, mm -hmm. but it also has to, to hold the wheel upright. If you took the strut out, the wheel would just fall in. Mm -hmm. So there's all this bending load on the strut from the weight of the car. And to counteract that bending load, because that, that bend will make it bind up, it can put some friction in it. Yeah. You mount the spring perch at an angle, so the spring pushes back out the same amount that the car that the wheel is pushing in. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did with this uh, this model is we we used to have a, the same spring on both sides, and since it's wound in a particular direction, you can't get exactly the same uh, cancellation force on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to sort of set up a, a compromise position that we did the best we could. We now have different springs on each side. The spring perches are more fine-tuned to, to precisely cancel out the, the side load from the weight of the car. And our struts are angled back quite a bit because we have uh, like six and a half degrees of caster in this car. Uh, and so we've also you know, angled it in that direction to cancel out that bending load. So it's much easier for the suspension to start to move. That makes the cornering posture feel better. It also takes out some of the compromise between good ride and good steering and handling. Because if you have a lot of friction in, in the shock, then to get it to move easily over a bump, you have to soften the, the damping or soften the spring rate, and then your handling goes to hell. So the less friction we have, the more we can keep the spring rate, keep the damping, and still move easily over a bump and still be comfortable. 